learning from our peers, for most of us, is the natural way to learn. Hello, Sales Nation. Welcome to today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. On today's show, we have Mark Magnaka. He's the co-founder of Aligo. And on today's show, he's very simply sharing with us the best ways to get better at selling. It's as simple as that. Loads to go out with this one, Sales Nation. So I hope you enjoy it. Find out more about Mark over at aligo.com. We link to everything we talk about in the show notes over at salesmanpodcast.com. And with all that said, let's jump into today's show. Hi, Mark, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm glad to have you on, sir. There's, just from our conversation before I click record, there's so much to, so much that we can potentially go into this episode. And so uh, I know there's, you know, hopefully there'll be a bunch of rabbit holes that we can dive into and, and get deep with uh, the context and the, the content of today's conversation. But I want to start, as I always do, with a totally super ended, super open-ended question to give you an opportunity to kind of lead the conversation to a certain extent. And that is by asking the question, Mark, what is the best way or the best platform or the best style of learning for sales professionals? What is in 2017, the you know 20 odd thousand people are gonna to listen to this right now. How should they be improving their sales skills? Well, you know, I'm a big believer, Will, in figuring out what do people actually do to answer that question. And I can tell you that based on my experience as a salesperson, as a sales trainer, and now running a company, Alego, which is a mobile video sales learning platform, I can tell you that learning from our peers, for most of us, is the natural way to learn. If you think about it, any national sales meeting, what is it that most salespeople want to hear? They want to hear from the best salespeople. And sometimes it's different salespeople for different groups. I know, for example, you have a background in, in medical devices. We have a, a number of medical device customers where they'll take the best practice in a short video of one of their best salespeople delivering their message. Sometimes they'll even have that salesperson when they come out of an, a, meet, a meeting with a, a doctor or with a hospital, record a short video on the fly and be able to quickly share that and say, hey, this is an objection that just came up. Let me tell you how I answered it. So at the high level, I would tell you learning from our peers is the, the key learning methodology that I see as most effective and video is just a great way to communicate the message and be able to capture it so that it can be used again and again. So I love this. We're totally on the same frame of mind uh, with, with this conversation, Mark, because I know we talk about this all the time on the show. Whether you look at books, for an example, as a learning resource, which are great in a lot of scenarios, they go out of date quickly. They are written you know, primarily not by sales practitioners, not by salespeople. They're in the trenches. They can often be data led. But I think for the individual salesperson, the, the B2B sales professional who's listening to this, driving on their way to the next meeting, clearly peer-to-peer -peer learning, if we can call it that, if there might, be, <laughs> there might be a better way to describe it. But that is the best way to go about all this. So we'll come on to video. We'll come on to your platform. We'll come on to more sophisticated ways of doing this in, in a minute. But is this as simple as just having a mentor within your company, spending time with them and trying to suss out and figure out their processes so you can copy it? That's a great question. And I can tell you that the answer, the short answer is no, it's <laughs> not. And the reason why is because when you think about most top performers, well, they don't even know what they're doing. They are very often unconsciously competent. So the metaphor I would give you is it would be like saying, just go stand in the kitchen while a great chef is preparing a chocolate cake. Don't write anything down and try to memorize all of the different steps as they crack eggs and stir in flour and salt and sugar. It's just very hard to do it that way. So what, what I believe is that um, sometimes the best learning happens when you don't even know that you're learning. So we're believers in helping people capture short videos. Sometimes it's even a sound bite that a salesperson can go listen to and then being able to easily sequence them together into a course. So some of the learning is what we'll call just in time, which is like watching a short YouTube video on something you want to learn how to do, such as how do you address this objection on this product? And then some of it is more of a sequential based learning, but not the old fashioned e-learning where you sit in front of a computer screen and just grind through slide after slide. Rather watching a short role player watching one of your peers and then being able to respond and get some direct feedback from your manager or a trainer or someone else 
who's got the ability to help quantify what you're doing. So you use the word grind then, and I think a lot of sales training is still stuck in this area of lots of text on screen, consciously having to force, you just use the word, I use the for, very consciously use the word force then, force yourself to go through it. A lot of it is product led versus the actual scenarios and the selling situations themselves. Why right. does, um, and, and this should be quite, and I can give an example of this as well, but why is video the best platform for this? And why like now in 2017 is is video the the platform for all content that's coming out? Well, first of all, I mean, you just sort of look at your own life, right? And if you think about um, the way that we like to consume information, you were talking about books before. Um, I'm the author of two books. I happen to be a person who reads a lot of books, but I know that the vast majority of people don't even read one book in a year, right? And if you think about it, for the average person who's reading all kinds of emails, how often as you're going through an email when you get to a link that someone sent you and it's a short video, is it, it's just a break from the, the text-based monotony that most of us experience. And you know, one of the things that I've seen, and this really started with Gen X and it's moved on all the way into even a higher form with millennials, is that uh, in 1969, there was a, an epic thing that happened, and that was the launch of the television show Sesame Street. In Sesame Street, for a whole generation of kids, television became a way to learn. It happened to be video-based, but it was a, a really a scientific way of helping people, in this case kids, learn how to count, learn their letters, learn all kinds of stuff that they didn't even realize they were learning because they were having fun watching the video and video just has so many unique properties because of the way our brains work with both uh, motion as well as with sound, pulling it all together. It's just a, an unbeatable combination in terms of the way human beings learn and most importantly, can remember things. And, and just touch on this for a second, because I find the science of all this really fascinating. I know the audience will as well. Why does visual movement on screen and sound coming at you and animations and bright lights and colors. Why does this make the learning process easier than <laughs> forcing yourself to sit in a, in a room and stir at a blank page of text? Yeah, well, there's a lot of neuroscience now that's coming out that's talk, that, that can really help depict exactly from a neurological standpoint why it works. But if you put the science aside, it keeps our attention. You just think about some of the, the YouTube videos, for example, that you've watched when, when something's happened and you've gone on YouTube to watch the short video. Video just has a unique way of capturing our attention, whether it was on Sesame Street or, or whether it's something very dramatic that we we're seeing on the news. And, and it does so in a way that a headline just doesn't capture. Yeah. The reason I want to dive into this a bit further is because I think, and tell me if I'm right or wrong, you may have uh, kind of thoughts on this as a, as a thought leader in the industry. I think things like video emails are gonna become more and more important for salespeople in the future. Uh, so turning this conversation of sales training on its head for a second, I think video emails, I think video outreach, more even Skype kind of video conversations. I think there's so much more emotion that you can tie to that. There's so much more rapport building you can do in the same amount of time. There's mm -hmm. something just to seeing someone's face as you're selling to them, even if it's through a pre-recorded video email versus um, a, a, a spammed email that can just be sent out over and over and over. Do you, do you feel that there's something to that over the next you know, 12, 18 months? Oh, it's, I think it's already happening. I mean, there, there's no question it's already happening. I can tell you an example uh, that one of our Lego customers is has just shared with me. We were having lunch and um, he was talking about one of the training programs that he's doing for a large group of salespeople. And they're still doing instructor-led uh, instructor training. So this hasn't fully replaced that. But what they're doing is they're sending a short video from the instructor before the class. And they're asking the participants to respond to one answer, kind of like the opening of your interviews. So now what happens is when this instructor walks into the room, instead of the traditional rapport building as a trainer, when you walk in, you're trying to get connected with people, they've already met him on video, right? And more importantly, he's already gotten a connection to them. So he he kind of understands who's who in the class and, and how he's going to spend his time. So that ability to cut the rapport building from, say, 90 minutes down to about five minutes is just one example of what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, and I think this goes even deeper. And you mentioned millennials earlier as well. So I'm 30. My little brother's 23. And there's a weird thing that happens in our house when everyone's home. So 
Um, I, my, I know occasionally my brothers and my dad listen to the show, so um, I won't slag them off too much. But my dad, <laughs> for years, years and years, I don't know how long the iPhone's been out for, a decade. Since 07. Yeah, 07. So, One so decade, yeah. A decade. So he has been adamant he will never have a smartphone. He will never... He'll look at us free in the room and be like, I'm never going to have my f- nose shoved up against this piece of glass when th- there's a tally on or when there's the opportunity to chat s- with someone. So two years ago, of course, he gets an iPhone and he's on it all the time, like everyone else on the whole of the planet sure. is. But we'll, there's me, my middle brother is 25, going on 26, and then my youngest who's 23. I will sit there, the TV will be on, we'll be chatting, half paying attention to TV. If my phone beeps, I will give that attention, then it'll be get put away. My middle brother is a little bit more, you know, would rather consume his content on his own time and will sit and chat to everyone, will not pay attention to the TV and will be on his phone. Whereas my youngest brother, and this is this made me change up the, everything that I'm doing with the sales and podcast as well. He is comfortable to have headphones in and consume video content on his phone and basically ignore everyone else in the room until like, He's brought into the conversation, and none of them are, you know, particularly shy or anything like that. None of them are particularly, um, you know, massive introverts. But that's right. just how everyone down this very small periods of time between our kind of you know birthdays, that's how the consuming content. So I see Elliot, who's the youngest, consuming content like this, and I think as everything does, it ages up. So me and Phil will all be watching videos, and eventually, I think. You know, uh, it's got to happen at some point that rather than us all half watching a TV show that we've compromised on because we, you know, there's only one TV, we'll all have VR goggles on and pretending that we're on the <laughs> beach or snowboarding or doing whatever, but we'll all be sat in the same room. That's going to be a weird scenario. It's going to be a weird reality to live in. And of course, that will translate over to business, you know, perhaps even further beyond the consumer side of things or in, in time that meetings will be held over VR and all that side of things. But the, the point of that little tale, Mark, was that I'm very conscious now that all the content we're producing, if we're not doing it in video, and you've got the opportunity to, as we're recording over Skype now, it seems like in two or three years' time, the blog post will now be a video post, and years beyond that, it will be an interactive 3D video of some sorts. And that is the way that everyone's going to consume, and that's probably the way that everyone wanted to consume content, both salespeople, both buyers, both people outside of that world, is this the way that we've always wanted to consume content, but technology's only allowed us to do it in the past you know, year, 18 months with increased bandwidth and, and smartphone technology? Well, I think that last point you make is critical about what has changed just relative from the technical standpoint. But let's just go back in time for a minute here. This is a kind of an interesting trend. You know, uh, Lucille Ball was a pioneer in television. But what a lot of people don't know is that The I Love Lucy show, she was the one who made the decision to record that show on film. They were called kinetoscopes at that time. And so people said to her, why why are you going to record the show? Everybody will have watched it already. I mean, what are they going to do? Watch it again? And sure enough, you know, more than 50 years later, I Love Lucy continues to play all over the world because of that film. So when you think about it, uh, there's, there's a couple things that have changed based on the, the story that you just gave within your own family. One, being able to capture something that can be used again in the future, that's, that's obviously well documented both from the movie business uh, into the television business. And, and being able to have content that is still valuable. So stuff from the 1950s is obviously still funny. And I think that has implications uh, as it relates to content creation. Because inherent with what you're talking about with your youngest brother, Will, is that we've gone from a culture where there was a small number of content creators and a large number of viewers to now a much bigger number of content creators. So your brother can be knocking out a video and and not be self-conscious about it at all or worry about lighting and makeup and all that other stuff. So now that we've got this content creation that's happening at a much bigger scale, we have a lot more content. But there's a problem with a lot more content. You know, back in the network days, you had somebody, and they weren't always right, but you had somebody whose job both at the news and on the programming schedule to try to figure out what show should we put in at 8 o'clock on Thursday night that we think the most people will be interested in. But now there's so much stuff, not just in the realm of video, but even in the realm of podcasts. People, The big issue now is how do I curate all of that content out there to find stuff that I care about? 
So I'm sure you've been on Netflix and and said to yourself, <laughs> I can't believe there's all these sh there's all these movies. There's nothing I want to watch. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've been through so I have a rule of this and cuz I would drive I, and I have driven myself crazy and it's both Netflix, it's when I look at a menu at a restaurant. I f I have to force myself cuz otherwise my brain processing gets used up on a stupid task when it could be used for something else. Right. The first thing that I think that looks okay, I choose, I commit to it. I put down the menu. I don't read the rest of it. So that's okay. how I get over it. But I I think this is a problem that millennials are going to see more and more and more. And I want to bring it back to sales for a second, Mark, because this is a conversation that I could genuinely talk about and dive into in a lot more detail. But bringing all this back to sales for a second, you mentioned something earlier on with regards to recording video. So as you highlighted then, we can now record video. We can create this content that is useful for a very specific niche we can create it essentially for free most sales people and especially all the the field sales people that i know and i had uh, when i when i worked in field sales and medical devices we all had an iphone or you know smartphone equivalent so there's no price to creating this content um what i want to get at though is what you mentioned earlier which is how do we know if the person that we're trying to model, if the peer that we're trying to take advice from, if they don't know what they're doing right, how do we know what to record to consume from them, if that makes sense? Yeah, well, that's, that's the reason why this doesn't happen just by itself. It's kind of like this. It's, it's like saying, well, well you're going to uh, buy Salesforce.com and you're going to give it to a salesperson and you're going to expect them to figure out how to set it up in a way that's logical and sequential so that there's a workflow. And that's not what most salespeople's job <laughs> is, right? So in the same way, when you think about a video platform, the, you know, the biggest challenge uh, people think is, well, I just, you know, I have an iPhone. I'll just, you know, record a three minute video and then I'll just send it out to my sales team. Well, Think that through for a minute. A three-minute video on your iPhone that you record in HD, when you try to send that, it's a 300-megabyte file. All right, so first of all, it's a big file. Now you've sent it to them, and it's either clogged up their email, or you might say, well, I'll just post it to YouTube. Okay, so you post it to YouTube. But then the question is, how do people find what they're looking for when they're looking for it? Is it properly tagged? Is there some way to easily access it? And then you come to something like Netflix or iTunes and you realize there's a value in having it organized in some kind of sequential manner by genre or by search box so you can find what you're looking for when you're looking for it. So what we've done at Lego is we've said, look, there's a much better way to do this. And from a technological standpoint, we figured out a way to compress video 25 times so that when you record a short video on your iPhone, it's up to the cloud fast and it's distributed fast and it plays fast. So that's, that's a big part of it because if people are getting hung up and the video is getting hung up, they're just not going to watch it. So, that's number one. So let me, let me just ask you on this then, so I'm right in my own mind. So yeah. uh, a Lego and um, um, I don't, I, off the top of my head, thinking about the industry, I'm not sure if there's anyone that provides that kind of service. There's obviously different ways of going about it, but using the Lego as, as an example as a platform then, is the skill in the fact that the platform is searchable so that when you are going to close a specific deal with a specific type of customer, you can search it so you so you can create lots of content and then the best bits are be able to be found. Is that the skill in this versus having the almost the artistic ability to capture the right moments and push them out? Um, you know, not just in time. Yeah, so let me answer that this way. We call that there's a top-down approach and there's a bottoms-up approach. So top-down is sort of management, sales leaders down, and bottoms-up is salespeople up. So uh, the best way to think about this, Will, is with what we call the three pillars of learning. Okay, so if you think about any sales organization, there's three kinds of learning. There's curriculum-based learning, which is some kind of course or sequential learning. There's reinforcement learning, where you're having some kind of follow-up after a training to reinforce the message. And then there's just in time, which is what you were just referring to. And that's the ability to go find something that you're looking for. And so what we've discovered is you really need all three of these over time if you look at the life cycle of a salesperson. When you start at a company, like in your medical device days, there was some kind of onboarding process. Some of the onboarding could be from product experts. Some of the onboarding could be from salespeople, but stringing those videos together in a logical way so that you can pick up where you left off, that's the curriculum part. Then you leave the training. 
There's got to be some easy way to reinforce what you've learned. Otherwise, we know 80% of what you learn disappears within 60 days of the training. And then finally, you're out in the field and you're interacting with a, with a doctor or with a, a healthcare professional in your old job, and you're looking to figure out how do I answer this question about this piece of uh, equipment related to endoscopy. Well, if I type that in, bang, up comes a couple of videos and I can literally watch it just like a YouTube. In fact, some of our com uh, customers even use the Salesforce integration we have so that when you open up an opportunity, well, it populates it with a couple of videos that are related to the subject that you have opened the opportunity on. How far, I'm gonna go um, to another planet here for a second. How far away are we? And realistically, I'm sure you've got some kind of thoughts on this, you know, being at the forefront of, of the company. How far away from we, if we've got all this data of when the best reps handle these specific opportunities and in a specific way, they have a specific outcome. How far away are we from modeling that into some kind of AI that can do a chunk of maybe not, and perhaps I'm underselling AI here, but perhaps not the conversation, but to almost give the salesperson a script to then relay across the table to the person they're speaking with. Uh, it's interesting that you bring it up. You know, my co-founder um, is an MIT graduate with a, a background not only in mathematics, uh, but in machine learning. So he's, I've learned a lot from him in terms of this very topic. Let me tell you, where we are right now is we're at the rules-based learning part of the curve. And, and so if I can use Amazon as an analog here, in the early days of Amazon, it was an if-then statement. Yep. If you bought a book on sales by this person, right, you might be interested in these other books because people who buy this book generally like that book. Mm -hmm. Over time, the algorithm has evolved, and now they're much more sophisticated with figuring out what you want next. And what I would tell you that I've learned, Will, is that you have to have a, a large data set in order for the algorithm or the AI to really do that. So step one is kind of using the if-then rules-based model, getting people comfortable with it, and then over time it gets better and better based on the data set. And I guess to just deepen down onto this for a second, because this fascinates me, it's clearly 10, 10 years ahead in sales is gonna be a totally different arena than what it is now. Can this be then context-based of so we know best practice from the individual. We know the scenario. We know the outcome that we're trying to get to that that individual got to and had success at. Could then AI in real time even, um, you know, provide you with the video as it does at the moment, but then provide you with extra context of the company is doing this. This person has just moved jobs and everything that you need to just have a conversation. So again, you pick up the phone and it's not just the if when of this person is you know a ceo you're trying to sell to him the company's done xyz not just the background knowledge but tied in with success in the past what background knowledge is actually effective for that conversation but the reason i ask this is i get and you probably do as well so many crappy emails every day trying to sell me stuff that are half kind of automated and half written sure. but the context of not just best practice for an individual who's had success, but that tied in with real-time industry kind of intelligence, that, that changes the game completely at that point. You know, it does. I, I will tell you though, well, I'm a believer that um, there is an art and there's a science to selling. And you know, some of it is about caring. And by that, I mean, it's caring enough mm -hmm. to do some homework. So the, the good news is, um, I think more of what you're talking about is certainly coming down the pipeline. I think the ability for salespeople to be in the scenario you just described and, for example, have part of the sales process be, you know, if you're selling a car, here's the video you should watch before you come into the showroom. <clears throat> here's a video that I'm going to send you after you've come into the showroom as a follow-up. I think video will continue to be a bigger part of the sales process. But the reality is you can do a lot of what you just described right now without artificial intelligence, <laughs> just using your own intelligence. And, and you know, I find a... Every time when I'm in front of groups of salespeople, if you're a salesperson and you're not doing some homework before you get in front of a customer and you're just winging it, you're absolutely on track to be disintermediated and disappear from the business. You know, Forrester Research says a million sales jobs in North America are going to disappear in the next five years. And the ones that are going to disappear fastest 
are really the order takers who aren't adding any insight, any value, and, and really aren't doing that kind of homework before interacting with a customer. And the people who are listening to this now are going, oh, crap, that's me. What do you say to them? Is this a, you need to shift your focus and in your job, you need to start adding more value? Or is it you need to get out of the space or the industry or the product that you're in and take that step forward? You know, you know, real genuine, like practical advice from yourself as a thought leader in the industry, Mark. What what should they be doing if there is just picked up and they're like, oh, you just described you just described what I've been doing for the past two years. Well, I think to an extent, it just depends on what you want. It's not that there won't be any order takers. They Forrester calls them order takers, explainers, navigators, and then consultants. They they refer to that as the four archetypes. And uh, it's not that there's not going to be any jobs for order takers, but the question is, what do you want to do? And for most people, who get into sales. They have some kind of a competitive nature. There's some level of motivation by money. And the people who are going to be earning the most money are the ones who are bringing insight and value. And they're doing that because they can challenge some of the assumptions that buyers have. If it was as simple as a buyer just Googling, this is what I want to buy, <laughs> watching three reviews, right? It's, it's just yeah. not that simple when you're dealing with complex stuff. So I think really becoming a student of the business, that's the best insurance against being made irrelevant. So final thing on this, Mark. So I'd like to leave the audience something super practical. So they're listening to this, they're commuting to the office or they're, they're driving to the next sales meeting right now as they're consuming this content. So, so I'd like to leave them with something practical that they can implement straight after the show. So we'll touch on Aligo in a second, but that aside for a minute, if it's, if it's not very effective to just spend time or ask a you know, the top salespeople within your team, if it's if it's not very effective to just because they don't know what they're doing right, which I've been in that scenario a bunch of times, trying to explain, well, I I just said this, or a lot of the time it's I just built rapport with them. And that doesn't really mean anything in without context of being and viewing the conversation and being involved in it and and, and feeling it to right. to use that kind of language. What what should they be doing to improve themselves from this idea of you know, mentorship or learning from their peers. What is the best way, I'll go aside for a second, to go about doing that? Well, again, I think it does come back in this case to video. And, um, you know, before there was video, there was audio, right? And so it was recording, the, it can be in a, a role play scenario, recording, what is it that you say in this situation? And then being able, in some cases, to transcribe it, in other cases, just to document it. Because the fact of the matter is, well, the words do matter. So part of it is the words, part of it is the way the words are delivered, and ultimately it's about being able to believe in your heart what you're talking about. So what, what we found is that there's a couple different levels. There's, if you're a manager listening to this, it's capturing what do your salespeople say be, just as an opening conversation. <laughs> do you know how many sales managers cringe when they're on a ride along with a salesperson? And they're thinking, where did you get this opening? You know, the, the very first thing that you said in the meeting. So for sales managers, it's it's being able to document what's the right way to open a meeting, as an example, what's the right way to close a meeting. And then as a salesperson, even though it's uncomfortable at first, practicing what you're going to say, even some of the questions you're going to ask, and being able to objectively look at, based on what I'm seeing here, does this person come through in a way that's compelling or is there something I need to change? And, and there's nothing more powerful than video, including your smartphone, just to get that process started. I think you've just you've just touched on two things then, which I'm so glad you did because you've added the context to the whole conversation with them. And I wouldn't have been able to put my finger on these two things. And the super practical one, doing role plays and videoing them so you can see yourself and how weird you look. So I, I, I've i had two experiences of this. First couple of podcast episodes I did, I would sit there when I was recording them, my hands on, like sat up straight. Everyone watching this on YouTube will get it. Everyone, everyone who's listened to this, I'll describe it. But I'd sit with my hands on the table, back up straight, and I'd be super polite and I wouldn't move my head. And I was thinking that I was being, um, I was trying to come across to the guest who sat in front of me on Skype as we record this, that I was you know, being attentive. And what I found was, if I wave my hands a little bit more than what I did, would do in real life, it adds a little bit more to the video and it makes it more interesting. So I have to overemphasize my, my arm waving just so the video <laughs> doesn't come across boring and it keeps attention. So that was the first thing. And then in medical device sales, I found 
Um, I recorded myself doing a presentation to about 15 surgeons, 15 urologists. And again, I was like slightly hunched because I'm, I'm tall and lanky and skinny. And so my posture wasn't great. So I was like hunched over a little bit and just opening up and standing straight and forcing myself to have that stereotypical kind of alpha, more confident stature on the next one that I videoed made all the difference. It made me look like I was more confident in what I was saying. There was loads of subtle things going on with it and just recording myself with my phone on a little tripod um, that was, you know, a 10 pound tripod on Amazon that just, you know, a couple of inches long that just sits on the table uh, to the side of you. That made the world a difference in my ability to public speak and present in front of these surgeons. And then the other thing is just doing this over role plays. So I'm very keen to not have the audience procrastinate on these kind of things and not put excuses into their mind. If they have to ask permission to record phone calls or ask permission to record video or ask permission to bring their manager in so they can record, it all gets a little bit weird and it's it's an opportunity to just not bother doing, you know, putting the process that you've described in place there, Mark. But doing a role play with your manager, just sat in a room, closed door, or, you know, your manager and then two salespeople going back and forth and recording that, <laughs> there's no excuses and there'll be so much content and so much um, self-reflection and seeing the best bits in other people that come from that, that it's a no-brainer. So I appreciate that, Mark. And with all that, mate, I've got one final question to ask everyone that comes on the show. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice that you'd give him to help him become better at selling? Well, I can tell you, <clears throat> that's a great question. And I think the key piece would be to make sure that you believe in what you're selling First and foremost, um, I'm happy to report that most of my sales career has been focused on selling things I absolutely believed in, but there were a couple of times I know that I wasn't totally sold on what I was selling, and as a result, I just didn't come through with the same passion. I didn't come through with the same enthusiasm, and I, I think people really can pick up if you are a believer in what you're selling. So if you're not a believer in what you're selling, then find something else that you can be a believer in. And I know in my own case, you know, there's just so many things that I'm personally enthusiastic about or excited about, uh, a Lego certainly being one of them, that makes it easy for me to have conversations with people and really communicate that emotion. Definitely. And just going back to what we said before or what you outlined before, Mark, doing a role play and pitching your product, if you can't make yourself look excited whether you are or not in that context it's going to be even worse and weird and awkward when there's a real person in front of you and i think a lot of people in the audience i think there are a lot of people will have been nodding the head as you said that then of maybe they're in the wrong role selling the wrong product and they could be even more successful in another one but obviously there's a there's a opportunity to procrastinate on that leap and that change so hopefully just video yourself talking about the product and I think that'll give you a pretty good insight as to how much you really care about it, just from how your face looks and how much of a smile you've got on it as, you, as you're talking about it. So I appreciate your insights today, Mark. And I want you to tell us a little bit more about Allego, just so it just add context to the conversation because we've touched on it a few times throughout the episode. Sure. So again, Allego is a, a mobile video sales learning platform. And basically what it, what it lets you do, Will, is uh, capture content using your mobile device very easily be able to upload that content. If you're a sales manager, it allows you to provide coaching asynchronously. So salesperson can record a short video. Uh, to give you an example, we have a, uh, a pharmaceutical company that has a new product coming out. And uh, what they wanna do is make sure that there's some consistency in the way the message is delivered. So particularly in regulated industries, it's really important that the message be delivered correctly. So imagine instead of having to fly 500 people in, and have them all get up in front of their respective managers, being able to send out a video of a subject matter expert, here's what the message looks like, here's what it sounds like, it's distributed to everybody, they have a week to practice, they can practice watching the video as many times as they want, then they have to submit theirs, with a tap of a button the video gets routed directly to their manager, and then using a built-in scorecard, their manager is able to certify them right on the spot, either you passed or you failed, and if you fail, they're able to give them point in time feedback. This is where your facts weren't correct. This is what you need to change. So we just had uh, in this particular pharmaceutical company, them go through this back in December. And literally 
uh, they were able to do in a course of two weeks using this kind of technology what would have cost them five times as much to fly everybody in and have everybody out of the field for at least three days. So being able to get certified and up and out selling using this kind of mobile technology is one of the key reasons uh, people are using technology like a Lego. Love it. I love it. I know my experience of big sales training events internally are that you'll go and sit in a big room. Someone will speak. You're probably not paying that much attention. And then everyone's only there because they're going to go and get drunk out uh, after, right. after the fact and obviously get, get to hang out with all the team. So I think there's real value in this continuous learning and you know however whatever platform you guys are using sales nation i think there's i just think there's real value in having a continuous learning schedule and not relying on a book twice a year or you know whatever ceb comes out with next or whatever the next sales training protocol is i think this ongoing learning platform the idea of learning from your peers i think there's i think there's real value in that so i appreciate that mark and uh yeah with that mate i want to thank you for joining us on the salesman podcast thank you